Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God. We've been waiting on you. We're ready just to get down to a good old rap session about the millennium. What happens in the millennium? What bodies are we in in the millennium? We started this in the last lecture. I felt there was a need because of the questions that we were receiving concerning the events that would happen in the millennium. We must synchronize our minds with God's Word to understand the millennium. Now, let's just recap briefly what we discovered in the last lecture. From the 20th chapter of the book of uh, Revelation, we discovered whom I believe to be Ang uh, Michael, the angel that controlled Satan, for it is written that he does, uh, Revelation chapter 12 puts a seal in a literal chain. By that I mean a holding device. He's locked away in the pit. All people, as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, are changed into a new spiritual body. Not soul, but body. You maintain the same soul. The soul that's in the inner man or woman in your flesh, body, or child. The same soul uh, elevates into that, and I use the word elevate correctly, because the mind then is open to total recall, even from the world it was, those events that happened. There will be no one that will be, let us say, feeble-minded, able to learn and absorb all things. God himself had placed the spirit of stupor, as it's written in Romans chapter 11, on many so they would receive the deception, even if you would, so that the Gentile could be grafted into the tree. In other words, their ignorance becomes a cloak of innocency. And when they are raised into that body, that's why every knee will bow to Almighty God on the first day of the millennium, to Jesus Christ, that is. Because they will understand he's not going to fry anyone at that moment like a piece of bacon. All people will have full knowledge before our God of love destroys anyone's soul. But through that millennium age, the people that take part in the first resurrection, that is to say, to recognize Antichrist for what he is when he sets foot on this earth, who are not deceived in their mind by the rapture theory, or that is to say, a gathering out before Antichrist appears, because it's not written in God's Word. Mistakenly, mistakenly, some people think it is, but they're wrong. And this is one of the sure signs that God has placed that spirit of slumber upon them. Even though they worship Antichrist in ignorance, with God himself being the uh, motivator of that deception, not deception, but being the motivator of the sleep, then they are innocent to be taught in the millennium. Once saved, always saved. Second chance, no. Most people don't have a chance today, unfortunately. But many will overcome and they will be teachers with Christ through the millennium age. That's to say, God's elect. Then Satan is released at the end of the millennium reign for a short season and people are judged by their works in the millennium only, not this earth age. Do you understand? Judged by their works only in the millennium age. In other words, when Antichrist comes, Satan rather, the old dragon, the devil, comes against the new city, the new Jerusalem, the Jerusalem of the millennium temple that we'll be learning more of in this lecture, many will follow him. If you're t that's your work, is to follow Satan after being taught beyond any reasonable doubt. You will have made your choice, and you will be judged by that, and need I say, you won't have a prayer. You'll be gone. Because when he is placed in the pit, people walk by as it's written in Isaiah 14 and say, is this the man that deceived the nations, the world? And so, works only at the end of the millennium, which has nothing to do with the faith judgment at the end of this earth, um, this particular segment of this cosmos, this earth 
age. So, we had discovered then that in verse 14 of this 20th chapter that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In other words, when hell comes into being, it is not the first death. Do you understand? When hell becomes de facto, not one entity other than a system and a false prophet have entered that lake of fire at this point. Not one human being. But when you enter that lake of fire, that is the second death. Do you know why it's called the second death? It's the final death. There is no more. It is fini. It is all over. Let's go ahead now in that 20th chapter with verse 15. What happens then? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That was it. There will be no second chances. It will be very final at the end of that millennium reign. There will be no one without excuse. There will be no mental retardation during the millennium whereby anyone can think uh, for themselves to the point of being able to decide whether they would or would not follow Christ or whether they would follow Satan. The choice is theirs. Okay, now, the book of Ezekiel, you will find more written prophecy and descriptive uh, events, chapters, than any other place in God's Word. From chapter 40 of Ezekiel forward to the very end, which is to say 48, even to the, the um, 48th chapter, those eight, nine chapters are concerning the millennium. The 44th chapter is very interesting because the prince of our people, who I believe is uh, the same David that was the prince bef in the, before Christ, through whom Christ would come, is ruling and reigning. And um, we see, and those of you that wish to make a little side trip of that, you'll find in verse 3 of chapter 44, it is for the prince, the prince. Who is the prince? Read um, the 34th chapter of Ezekiel and the 24th verse. You'll find who the prince is. Then it tells of the Levitical priesthood that goes astray when Israel grows, goes astray, or the other people, the Christians, if you like. That is to say, when Antichrist appears on this earth, they will have heard the truth taught, but they will reject it. They will go astray when other Christians and people, the world does, after Antichrist. But when they hear God's elect stand up and witness for Christ, for His sake, as it's written in Mark 13, they will recognize those same people were teaching this before Antichrist appeared. And it's happening exactly as they declared the scriptures uh, spoke, had spoken of. It's coming to pass exactly that way. They will come out and they will have nothing to do with Antichrist any longer. Therefore, they will be known as the Levitical priest and they will teach. They are, there are 144,000 of them. But let's pick it up in the 15th verse of the 44th chapter. Those of you that have studied my work on the acrostics of 11, remember 411s is 44. God has many secrets hidden within the framework and numerics. Um, note, we come to this 15th verse, and we talk here, let's read it if we may, 15, Ezekiel 44. But the priest, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary. They were not deceived for one moment. They were not deceived by Antichrist. When the children, they kept the sanctuary clean, they kept it pure. When the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. Now you must translate this to the fact that there is no flesh here. This is the gift or the sacrifices and of this time. So, we see that God's elect, those Zadok, what does the Zadok mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means the just, the upright ones, God's election. 
they're going to be able to serve God. You hear many people say, oh, it'll be wonderful when the millennium comes, we can all run up to Jesus. Not so, friend. There will be so few that are in this final generation that will be in that first resurrection that there will be very few that are able to serve him. They were going to be deceived and the base of it is the rapture theory. I know that offends some, but bless your hearts, it's truth. If you can't accept it now, then accept it after Antichrist appears and you hear it taught then. Come out. God's in control. Verse 16. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they only. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, unto Christ himself, the Son of the living God, and they shall keep my charge. Do you know what this word uh, charge is in the uh, Hebrew? It's a watch. Nothing changes. They're still watchmen. They are sentries, in a sense, if you would, that watch over his commands, his orders. Verse 17. And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gate of the inner court, the inner court, of course, is his place, they shall be clothed with linen garments and no wool shall come upon them whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. Now, what is the linen that is the righteous garments that those wear spoken of in the book of Revelation? The garments you will have in heaven. Remember you were taught in the book of Revelation that your righteous acts made up the material, the linen, which you would wear. Beware that you not appear naked. In other words, that your righteous acts were so few that you wouldn't have any linen garments. What he's saying here. These same lemon, linen garments. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To him, these are the Zadok's righteous acts. They must have those righteous acts or they don't appear at his table. You cannot wallow before Antichrist in his deception and still be at Christ's table. It won't fly. And they are to put no wool next to them. That is to say man uh, spun garments. They must be the real thing. Verse 18. They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads and shall have linen breeches, breeches, this is the same material, upon their loins, and they shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. Now in the Hebrew tongue, this is yerzah, and yerzah is they shall wear no wool or any other material that causes one to sweat. You will not wear a sweat suit. Do you understand? You will have on your righteous acts. What would you do if you were to wear a man spun thing? And please think spiritual. With, Rachel, with your righteous acts being your reward, your honor, your badge to be able to approach Yeshua Messiah. If you tried to make some homespun, man-made thing, the very tension of having the wrong garment on in his presence would bring sweat and perspiration. That's the only way it can be described in, in modern day language uh, to one in a flesh body to understand the tension and the pressure in the spiritual body that would be held if you tried to work your way in there with the wrong garment on. The same as the man at the wedding with the wrong garment on. I speak spiritual. Please understand. Okay, verse 19, continuing. And when they go forth into the utter court, even into the utter court of the people, when they go to this outer court that is away from the inner court where Christ abides, they shall put off their garments wherein they ministered. You don't wear those acts out there. 
and lay them in the holy chambers, and they shall put on other garments. And they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. You're not going to wear those righteous acts out there and sanctify anyone with them. You're going to have on work clothes because you're going to work. You're going to deal it out for they deserve it. But you will not wear those righteous acts and bestow that before them. They're not worthy of it at this time. Verse 20. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads. Isn't it marvelous how God always does things using common sense? Not overdoing it in any direction, just using common sense. Of course, there are many things that have to do with this, but um, you, you know the vow of the Nazarite, etc., you can apply that. I'm not going to take the time to do it in this lecture. You apply this to this, and you must remember, you've got to leave the flesh, everything you know in the flesh, and come to the millennium age to understand what we're talking about. All these people that Arkin we're talking about and that we are concerned with are in an incorruptible body. That means a body that doesn't age, doesn't wither, doesn't grow old. But they've got some lousy souls, some of them. All right? They have, still have a mortal soul, meaning simply in the Greek tongue, liable to die. They are not first fruits, and they have not overcome. Verse 21, Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. You do not do that in Christ's presence. 22, Neither shall they take for their wives, a widow. I thought we, there was no marriage when we had the new body, that we were as the angels. That's true. But there is a wedding taking place and being prepared even here. It's not the wedding of the marriage lamb that will happen with the first fruits, but there will still be another wedding. And this has reference to that. Nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow that hath a priest before. In other words, you must think, those that were not deceived by Antichrist, it would seem possibly that there will be fringe areas. Now, the, this is my thought. I will not document it past this point, but it becomes obvious. Other than the 144,000 priests that are brought to God. That's the Levitical priest before. We're talking about the 7,000 of God's election spoken of in Romans chapter 11 when you speak of the Zadok and the ethnos that will join them. But it would appear that through the ethnos or through another form that there will be others that will be able to participate, yes, even during the millennium, else this would not be written. Enough said on that. Now I want you to listen to the reward for those that have ears to hear and eyes to see. It's the greatest promises in God's Word. He could never aim or direct a promise so precious as this, nor does He ever at any other group of people, only His elect. Listen to those promises, 23. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. They're going to teach the difference between the true Christ and Satan, who is the false Christ. And cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. There will be no more rapture theory taught at this time. I mean, well, that would be obvious because Christ has already returned. Uh-uh. Not for most he has not. They cannot approach him. They cannot touch him. He does not want them until after the second death has taken place and the great white throne judgment has taken place and they are worthy. Do you know, he even penalizes some of the election that go and touch those filthy people. I love them, but I'm saying that in a, so that you can better understand in a spiritual sense who will come near Christ and who he will consider worthy. 
Beloved, if you have ears to hear, you can. You can stand up for Him. Do you realize that in the Greek tongue, the word resurrection has three meanings, and one of them is to stand up for Christ? Wouldn't you rather do it now and earn these promises we're reading of? To be able to teach, to be one of those priests uh, that will teach for that thousand year period. To be able to help people. Verse 24, to have compassion. And in controversy they shall stand in judgment. Yes, hard to believe, but the election shall stand in judgment, in controversy. And they shall judge it according to my judgments, fair, square, exactly Christ's way. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all mine assemblies. And they shall hallow my Sabbaths. In other words, they're going to be very obedient, even as they are now. Oh, we all slip, beloved. Yes, even God's elect. It doesn't mean you're perfect in the flesh. But we're not talking about flesh here. We will no longer be in the flesh. Come with me, mentally and spiritually, to the millennium age, when we are in those incorruptible bodies. Everybody, sinners, saints, and in between. Another reward for you. Listen, 25. And they shall come at no dead person to defile themselves. What is this? Dead people in the millennium, the same dead that are spoken of in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. Mortals, meaning they're liable to die. All flesh is already dead, gone, zip, no more. It's done away with. The first death over and gone. We're all in that spiritual body. We're waiting the second death, or preferably the second resurrection. In other words, it's your loved ones that are deceived by the rapture theory or some of the other things that are taught contrary to the Word of God. You cannot touch them, but listen, you cannot touch them to defile themselves, but, you understand? Now this is why I tell you that you will be able to help your loved ones during the millennium. You will be able to recognize them. You can speak to them. You can encourage them. You can, in righteous dig indignation, chew them out if they get in trouble. But a very few will be afforded that. That's one of the promises for standing against Antichrist. But for father or for mother, or for son, or for daughter, for brother, or for sister that hath not had that hath no husband, they may defile themselves. You may go out. Now this is the priesthood of the Zadok. That you, if you see one of them in trouble, you see them waning back toward that pit again where Satan is chained. You can go to them and say, "Hey, get your act." together or you're going in the lake of fire with him. You're treading on dangerous ground. We're not talking about the death of the flesh in this millennium. We're talking about the death of your very soul. In other words, you're going to be able to teach them one-on-one, -on -one, to help them, to support them, to encourage them, to love them. But you're going to pay a little bit of a price for it. Christ does not want them near him. I'm not talking about your mother, your brother. Some of them may be in better standing than you are. I'm saying those that did not make it, that are still mortal, meaning liable to die. Christ doesn't want them near him, nor does he want you near them after you have talked to them, which is to say, uh, touch them in this sense. Or defile yourself, which simply means to go in their presence. 26. And after he is cleansed, they shall reckon unto him seven days. In other words, you're going to have to wait seven days before you can go back in the presence of Jesus, even after you've cleansed yourself. Do you want to know what Jesus thinks about people that wrap themselves up in the rapture theory? I think that'll say it pretty well. well. Why is he always saying that about the rapture? I don't understand. Because the rapture theory was dreamed up by a woman through evil spirits. It is documented in church history. It happened in the year 1830. It is the theory that the true Christ shall come first and gather people away. It is not according to God's plan. 
Why would Satan want to teach that? Because Satan knew from the beginning that he would be allowed a short season before Heman, Heman Gog and Armageddon. And by instilling this teaching in the minds of the multitude, they would accept him instead of the true Christ when he returned to this earth. Friend, it's that simple. Well, why is it that you're the only one that teaches this? Because I am a servant of the living God. And it is time. God, uh, many ministers, well, why won't they teach it? If they had eyes to see and were established in a denomination, they would lose their retirement, their church, they would lose everything. It's not an easy thing to pass upon them. Would they be better off if they had eyes to see? They would, they would be the richest people in the world to walk away from it at teaching the truth. But church systems will not allow it. Well, aren't you afraid you'll never have a very big crowd teaching against the rapture? I know I won't. But what I do have is so precious. They are the elect of God that have eyes to see and ears to hear. You see, I don't really have them. Christ has them. They are his servants. They will minister unto him. And there are promises waiting for them that makes any trial or tribulation you have in this flesh body, this earth age, seem like child's play compared to the glory and the honor that is received in the millennium kingdom. I tell you this, it shall happen to this generation. Many sleep, let them sleep. God himself has put the blinders on them. They cannot see the truth, nor should you wake them. That is why Jesus said, plant a seed and if it grows, fine. If it doesn't, leave it alone. You must pay that price of seven days for helping one of your loved ones. You know what? That's a small price to pay, isn't it? This is why that I say, when someone, and this is why you might see my Irish flicker a little when someone says, I just want to make it. All I want to know is that I just make it through the door. I want to be saved, just barely. That's not good enough. You've got to have compassion on your people or you're not one of God's elect. You've got to want to make it yourself and be able to pull some with you to have that inbred desire to be a comfort to the children of Almighty God. So understand how I feel when someone is selfishly worrying about themselves only. They're probably not one of God's elect because one of the traits of his elect is they have compassion for God's children that suffer deception. 27. And in the day that he goeth into the sanctuary, in other words, after he has been cleansed and then waited the seven days, and he enters the sanctuary unto the inner court to minister in the sanctuary, he shall offer his sin offering, saith the Lord God. In other words, you're going to pay. Do you understand a sin offering? Because you actually touched, not touched, you defiled yourself by going near that loved one. It'll be worth it. Christ will even love you for it, but you're still going to pay. Don't worry, you'll be able to afford it. You know why? 28. Listen closely and absorb the words of God. And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. What will be unto them for an inheritance? I am their inheritance. That's your inheritance. The living God. Can you comprehend that? Can your mind absorb it? Almighty God is your inheritance if you have eyes to see. Very few men or women or children can, can grasp that. And ye shall give them no possession in Israel. You're not to give them one thing. I am their possession. Do you understand what is said there? You're not to give them anything that man allots, for God is their possession and God owns it all. And he is their possession. In other words, God's elect own all, wherever they stand. Will they take advantage of that? Of course not. It is ridiculous to even have a thought of that nature, for God's Zadok, his elect, are interested in those, God's children, 
in the office that God places them in. And Almighty God is their possession. Do you know something? It won't give them the big head. It will not put them on an ego trip. If that would put you on an ego trip, then don't worry, it won't happen to you. And you're not one of God's elect. God's elect do not go on ego trips. The very fact of the truth, the possession, the promise, is such an humbling, overwhelming, awesome thought of the love and the understanding, the judgment, the teaching, the helping is to belong to God and God belonging to you to be able to help man. Why did God create things, yes even people, for his pleasure, therefore for yours? For if you be one of God's elect, then God is your possession. Understand and thank him every day don't stop thanking him daily. I don't mean, I mean once a day is sufficient unless you feel pressed. Don't, don't go into repetition. He's so precious to us. 29. They shall eat the meat offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering, and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs, every devoted thing. And the first of all the first fruits of all things and of every oblation of all, of Every sort of your oblations, that's your offerings, daily burnt offerings, shall be the priest. And ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. Whatever you give the real priest, even in this age, when you give him that first dough, that is to say the first of your offering, it causes a blessing upon you because it is given to serve Almighty God. Real quickly, turn with me to close this discussion to the book of Revelation. Back again to chapter 20. And we're going to read just one or two verses in chapter 21. What happens then? Remember, we have visited the millennium age and daily life there in that book of Ezekiel in chapter 44. In chapter 20, we witnessed the lake of fire they walking in, the second death. Now, what happens then? The eternity begins. It's another lesson for another time, but listen carefully. Verse 20, chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven. This is the new heaven age, the third one, beloved, spoken of by Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3. And a new earth, uh, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Every sea, even the lake of fire, draw, dried up. This word new is not as you think of new in the English. It's rejuvenated. The same as it was rejuvenated when this earth age started after the Kabeu, the overthrow of Satan from the world that was. That's why when scientists say this earth is millions of years old, they are exactly correct and the Bible declares it when you understand. And I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Read Ezekiel chapter 16, the Jerusalem. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. De facto, the Godhead is living, dwelling with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. For, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Do you understand that? The pit and the death is done away with. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. Yes, that lake of fire that the souls walk into and are consumed. Many people are taught, they're going to lay in that place and scream for a drop of water on their tongue forever and crying and squalling. No, that's not what the Word says. It says this Word says there's not going to be a tear. Not in this whole new earth age will there be a tear. I think if people were still burning to a crisp in my sight, I might shed a tear. But you see, the seas are all dried up, even the lake of fire. There is no more death. There is no more pain. 
for truly as pain is described in the parable and it was only a parable of Lazarus and the rich man in the fire there would still be pain so mature and grow up God is a loving God fear not he who can destroy your body but your soul he destroys their souls they are turned to ashes forever and ever and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. You can count on it, beloved. It is your promise. I hope that I have been able to explain this. It's a difficult task to feel within oneself that you have adequately covered the material that you have taken the student with you to the world that shall be the millennium and then into the new earth age there will be no more flesh it's difficult to jar people loose from the flesh and out of the flesh where they can take a good look at the millennium I hope I've done that for you and I hope that it will help you better understand our father's word and most of all his plan his loving plan the way most people teach our father, you have him with the two horns, the red long handle underwear, and the pitchfork, throwing people into hell. That's not our father. Our father brings people out. Satan drags them in. And then it's done. And there shall be no more pain. Nor will there ever be another tear. What a time to look forward to. Do you have a part in that? Do you find serving God exciting enough that it makes it worthwhile to put up with a little uh, pain, <clears throat> excuse me, pain being called, if you would, perhaps an oddball for teaching the real word? I would hope not. Our Father's in control. We have the truth and the victory in Him. Bless your heart. You listen a moment. I want to share something with you. Oh, beloved, I want to share.